Ćao svima, ja sam Mirko. Ja sam Tamara. Danas će naša tema biti Big F***ing Patch 2. Dobrodošli u Devlog 8. Ja mas daj vorm. I danas ćemo cekirati Devlog 8. Počnimo. We are very excited to finally bring you what we think is just first iteration of our design for endgame content. There's some new stuff that we want to showcase in this devlog, uh, from the way you craft and gain recipes to the way you upgrade your character. So it turns out I was wrong in my previous video regarding crafting. There is actually more on the horizon and we will look into this in a little bit. Recipe drops has been significantly nerfed. The main reason for this change is the fact that we wanted to separate the chase for recipes and materials and chase for that perfect drop. This is something that was mentioned in one of my previous videos as well. The dropped item system works just really well. It is easy to progress using dropped items. However, crafting was not really in a good place and this is about to change. Starting with this patch you will encounter a new mysterious entity in the land of Rod. This entity, if handled correctly, is guaranteed to grant you new powerful recipes. Accessing these mysterious places will require a very special kind of item and some mechanical skill. This specific item that we're looking at here is the Shroud Cage. That leads me to believe this is an item that originated in the Shroud. Maybe it holds some matter or a soul because it is a cage. Whenever this exits the Shroud, we can see in the design what happens. It spawns, it lights up, it breaks and drops a recipe and then it vanishes, leaving the recipe behind. I really appreciate the sneak peek into the design here and the schematics and I would really love to see more of this in future devlogs. There are apparently also specific requirements that have to do with entering places like this and I'm assuming that this has to do with entering the Shroud as Mladen spoke of before as well. The idea is that if you're interested in crafting there is a streamlined and clear way of finding recipes and you do not have to rely on drops exclusively. And this is the main takeaway here. Both crafting and dropped items should be a viable way to upgrade your gear. By separating these two mechanics you can make both interesting and viable at the same time. So this concept sounds really good. We are continuing our work on the way you interact with your favorite heroes and their abilities. We wanted to give you a way to further upgrade your character once you're done with leveling up. After patch 0.6 all characters will be able to get additional skill points by finishing a special kind of quest. This has been mentioned before as well and this should not come as a surprise if you have been following some of these devlogs. Legendaries will work a little differently from now on. All legendary weapons will now come with a new legendary power. The role of these new legendary powers is to give a little flair and additional damage to your heroes. This is something that I did not anticipate. I thought the legendary system was pretty much flashed out by now and there would be maybe a few small changes. But this is not the case. There is actually going to be a significant overhaul that is yet to come. More specifically, Mirko is talking here about flair and power. And the flare refers to some of the visual components, some of the visual effects that you can have on these legendary items. These legendary powers will bring a combination of flare, so visual things, visual components, and also damage procs. And this is a little different from the fabled powers. However, the real game changers come with special attributes that transform your legendary items to fabled items. Fabled powers, or fabled weapons that you can create using fabled powers, are much more game-changing mechanics. They change your build, they change your characters, abilities, that kind of thing. And these fabled attributes are usually hero-specific and really change the way you play the game. And that is what separates them from legendary powers, which are more generic, visual and only minor increases in damage, for example. In order to gain fable attributes, you will have to enter a special battle with Furun. After you finish this battle, you will gain access to the very Forge of Gods. Placing your legendary weapon on the God's Forge will imbue the item with one of the fabled powers. This gives you a pretty decent idea of how this is going to work. Kill Furun, use a forge, get a bit of RNG and then you have a new fabled attribute on your legendary weapon. You can only roll one fabled attribute per battle, so hopefully gods are on your side. All legendary powers that used to be on your legendary items will now be available as fabled attributes. 
So once again, taking the example of the Oathbreaker, the locked and loaded mechanic will not be part of the Oathbreaker's legendary power anymore. Instead, it will be a fabled attribute that you can use and craft and imbue basically on a legendary weapon if you use the Forge of the Gods. We also have a lot of new fabled attributes which have never been seen in the game before. This means that you will be able to combine your favorite power with any legendary that you prefer which will make both the hunt for the perfect item easier and the possibilities for different builds greater. All this new stuff will of course feature some interesting enemies, bosses and fights. And that's the conclusion. Makes sense, right? You have all these legendary powers that are now unique to certain weapons that will not be unique to certain weapons anymore. They will actually be fabled attributes. Also, in addition to this, there will be a lot more fabled attributes which should allow us to create and be super creative, come up with a ton of builds just using fabled attributes and all you really need is a legendary item that you somewhat like. And you can just imbue that weapon over and over using Faroon's Forge to basically come up with super creative builds. I'm super excited about this. It looks amazing on paper and I can't wait to test this out in the actual game. In this patch, we'll be introducing a very first version of a really exciting feature, Schools of Magic. Each item that drops from now on will have a chance to belong to a specific school of magic. Collecting a set of these items will not only give you a stat boost, but actually a new visual upgrade depending on the school of magic that you choose. It sounds like we need to make a choice for an actual school of magic. How we are getting all these specific items though remains to be seen, that is still totally unclear. Like we mentioned earlier, we plan to make schools of magic even more meaningful in the future. Not only in the visual sense, but also in the mechanical. Uh, we really hope that for now you guys will manage to have fun with all of these different visuals and the improved stats. My main takeaway here is that we get a new system that shows off some visual flair once again and also does some damage impact. However, the entire system is not completely flashed out. We are already allowed to play around with it a little bit, but the completion of the system will be probably done after this game releases. I'm going to summarize this section by telling you that the combat on the controller works pretty well. Navigation in the Pantheon and within menus not so well yet. The hope is to fix that before the release. One of the most sought after features since our early access was click to move control. And we fought long and hard but in the end we had to acknowledge that a sizable amount of players really enjoy uh, using this control scheme. The interesting section here is not so much the click to move in itself. I mean, it will be implemented, it will probably work fine, nothing to worry about. What is interesting here to me is that Samara is mentioning that they fought long and hard but in the end decided to implement click to move. And that may seem a little bit weird if you don't know any of the history going on here. So let me elaborate on that a little bit so you have a better understanding what is actually going on here. Pagan Online, like any IT product or game or something creative usually, is designed based on design principles. I don't know all of these design principles, but WASD movement was one of them. And they have mentioned in the Discord and even in the devlogs multiple times that this game was designed with WASD movement in mind. But it is a little bit more than that. A design principle is not just something that is in the back of your head and that you think, oh yeah, I was designed with this in mind. No, it goes a little bit further. It is actually like a pillar, a sort of part of the foundation of the entire game. You can compare it, for example, with the constitution and law. Any subsequent laws that are created cannot contradict basically the constitution. The constitution is the foundation on which the rest of the law is built. And there's a lot of professions and crafts that have these things. For example, the Hippocrates Oath with medical profession. There's all these kind of things. They serve roughly the same purpose, which is to give you like a basic set of principles and rules to abide by. And these principles are usually created before you do anything else. Hence the foundation. They are the foundation of your game. Once everybody agrees on these design principles, you usually continue designing the rest of your game. So when it turns out, for example, that a lot of people on Steam actually don't like the WASD movement, and I'm not saying the majority doesn't, I'm not saying that you don't, I'm just saying that there is a significant amount of people that have issues with the WASD movement on Steam, on the forums, on Reddit, 
all over the place basically and then this creates a complex situation you have your design principle on the one end and you have a large group of people on the other hand that don't agree with your design principle basically and this creates an internal struggle i'm sure on the one hand people and the developers probably want to stick to these design principles that is why they are there but on the other hand, you also need to sell copies. I've said this before, but obviously all the people that you're watching in the devlog, for example, they don't work for free. They actually get paid and that might surprise you, it shouldn't. And this game needs to make some money. It needs to sell some copies. And in order to do that, you should not basically exclude large amounts of people that don't like one of your design principles just because it is a design principle. So after a long struggle, as Tamara mentioned, they decided that they are not going to have solely WASD movement in place, but also will implement click to move. And I do understand that struggle. I am dealing sometimes with similar things at my job and it's always a question about, well, we have principles on the one hand, but we also have, let's say, a reality on the other. And in my opinion, you should be pragmatic about these things these principles are there for a reason and you would also need a good reason to break with the principles. But in this case, in the case of paying online and the movement scheme, I think there is a very valid reason to go this route. First of all, because everybody who wants to play using WASD can still do so, that thing will not change. And everybody else who really likes click to move for whatever reason, and that is totally fine that they do, they also can play this game hopefully the way they want to and this way the overall audience and general gameplay population grows which is good for everybody for us as players there's more people to play with for the developers and wargaming as well because then they sell more copies bottom line it's never an easy decision but it's probably the right decision you can check out the dev section yourself guys i just really like how these devlogs are getting a bit more personal at times also the overall quality of the devlogs is getting better and better you may not really notice why but surely you picked up on this as well the whole video just flows better they are easily watchable they are very approachable and overall just enjoyable looking at this a bit more technically this has to do with the writing of the script which is less cringy than before and more tailored towards the people actually delivering the lines. The editing is much better with more versatility between shots, a good amount of cuts so you don't get bored and nice panning shots of design templates that are really informative and also great to share with the community. And last but not least, the personal touch that is added, such as the Serbian intro and outro showing the humans behind the developers or Emil's insane gaming rig. I'm jealous. I hope you enjoyed this devlog dissection. You can also join me live on twitch.tv slash thedieworm where I am streaming Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 8 p.m. Central European time and I hope to see you there. Thanks for watching. You made it all to the end for which I'm very grateful. I will see you very soon. Bye bye.